Hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Faraha Asani and I will be your host for the afternoon. I am the research lead at Watershed. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a black woman with mixed heritage. I have a, an Afro that reaches just above my shoulders. I'm wearing black rimmed glasses. I have a dark red lip, a dark green shirt on and also a houndstooth shawl. So just to give you kind of a description of how I look. And before we launch into the session, I would like to read out a couple of things just to get us started. The first thing to say is that we are being joined today by two BSL interpreters, so Paul and Harry, um, and they're going to be changing um, as we go along, so please do expect that. So today's session is the latest panel discussion in the series referred to as the Hopeful Future Seminar Series. This is hosted by the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D. And in this seminar series, we're thinking about sustainable growth, inclusion, climate emergencies, and responsible innovation. So um, today we're thinking also and talking to people who are actually working to put those things into action right now. Just to say that we have one more of these um, seminars that we're going to hold on the 18th of November. That is going to be a lot around the climate emergency. And I trust that one of my colleagues is popping a link into the chat right now. So please do feel free to register for that session as well and share it with as many people as you would like. Um, if you're interested in catching up on the other seminars that we've held before this point, they are available on the Watershed YouTube. And if you have to pop out before the end of today's session as well, this is also being recorded and it will also be shared on Watershed's YouTube. Um, so I'm just going to quickly mention how we're planning to run through the um, formatting today. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers. So today we're being joined by Khadija Diskin, Dr. Francesca Shabande, Tony Bajam, and Dr. Keith Hebden. I will give them all some time, five minutes or so, to introduce themselves and to give any opening thoughts. And then we're going to have a discussion together as a panel. So we have some prompts um, that are going to help us to guide our discussion today. There will be a section for Q&A, so if you have any questions, feel free to pop those into the Q&A um, section for the chat on Zoom. We would also like to invite you all to introduce yourselves in the chat if you feel comfortable to do so, and to you know leave any comments as we go along. But when you're introducing and leaving comments, please make sure that you, you send those to everyone, um, not into the Q&A section, which is going to reach only us um, on the panel. So before we dive into the conversation, I kind of, I, I strongly actually want to establish this as a safe space. The individuals that have been invited to join us on this panel today, um, I've had the privilege of working with them um, and of calling them my friends um, in different settings. There are people that I admire greatly. There are people whose work and activism I admire greatly. Um, I love them and I very much want for them to feel safe. So Tony, Francesca, Khadija, Keith, I hope to hold you all in this conversation as, as safely as possible. So in as much as today's session is going to be about knowledge exchange, it's also a discussion amongst friends. So I hope that that is the spirit that will guide us as we have our discussion. So with that being said, I'm going to keep quiet now and ask my panelists, our guests, to introduce themselves. And perhaps we can start with Khadija. Um, over to you, Khadija. Thank you so much, Raha. Um, and I really appreciate you holding me and holding everyone else in this space in safety. Um, so just to introduce myself, first of all, I'm a black woman. Um, I've got long black hair um, currently. Um, and I also have a nose piercing that is on my face. Um, it's really lovely to be here today um, with you all. Um, I'm always, always just so blessed to be around Faraha. Um, and I really do enjoy being and being around you and talking to you about all the things that sort of um, challenge us, push us. Um, and I'm looking forward to what I hope is a critical conversation about the various ways in which we can think about power. Um, I'm a PhD researcher. Um, my interests sort of fall in the intersection between race, class, and also how we think through language, how we think through discourse, um, and how we think through power as something that is negotiated and translated 
circulated through our interactions and discourse. Um, I'm also a sort of notorious Twitter shouter. So if you follow me, you'll, you'll see me often shouting very angrily about the state of oppression um, in various different contexts. Um, I like to identify myself as a critical scholar. And what that means is through my engagement within the academy, through my engagement with the various scholarships that I've been blessed to be sort of gifted with and been blessed and be a part of, um, I'm constantly thinking about how we can push past the sort of normalized ways we've come to think about the world, um, push past the ways in which we're socialized to think about the world and engage in what is a beautiful sort of form of, of knowledge exchange, which is getting to the depths of criticality, getting to the depths of the sort of plethora of experiences that we all have. Um, and I'm just so grateful to be here and looking forward to the conversation with so many wonderful people who I admire. Thank you so much, Khadija. Thank you for that. Tony, over to you. Thank you, Fraha, and thank you so much for inviting me <coughs> to be here today. Hey, everyone. My name's Tony. Um, I'm in my mid-30s, and I'm of South Asian background. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I've got shortish black hair. I've got a little bit of stubble. Um, and today I've got coming out the horrible end of a cold. So I'm channeling some sunshine by wearing quite a garishly yellow blazer today. Um, I'm in my living room at home in front of a blue wall with a shelving unit. It's mostly got plants, but trinkets as well. Um, I'm a producer working out of watersheds on the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D programme. You might occasionally hear me call it clusters. Uh, the programme explores the future of creative, creative technology in Bristol and Bath, supporting both academic and practice-based research, as well as the development of creative tech prototypes. Uh, this forms a basis of an exploration into how a community of practice is grown and nurtured and how that community drives forward the creative technology of the Southwest. I wear a specific inclusion hat on the programme, thinking about what inclusion is and how we generate better inclusive practice in our governance, policies and products. And we're about to launch a series of research questions to those ends, exploring governance, practice, technology through the lens of inclusion and inclusive innovation. My background is in building skills development programmes and developing creative research projects with art and technology, mostly for young people, but working wider on community projects as well. This means creating spaces for learning new ideas, as well as space to share our own, um, our own ideas and our own experiences in order that should, we should be able to build things better together. Um, I have a particular interest in how we achieve this through play and through creativity. Before starting this role, I developed um, the last programme that I developed was a, a programme called Don't Settle, which was a five year programme built with Birmingham Museums Trust, um, exploring how we can empower young people of colour in Birmingham and the black country to change the voice of heritage through arts, research and governance together. I believe really deeply in the power of process. That means making statements of intent that we can interrogate and that we can refine, uh, that we can try and remove gray areas. And if we can't remove them, that we can talk them to death and bottom them out and know what was gray and what's not and why it's gray and how we're gonna manage that. Uh, generally, you'll find me nailing manifestos to things in the middle of the night. At any given table, you'll find me asking questions like, well, who's this for? And how is it for them? And why is it for them? Did you ask them, do they need this? And more importantly, do they need this from you? These are some of the questions that I'm working on right now in clusters. Co-design is really imperative to this work. <clears throat> I'm also very interested in the ideas of legacy and equity. So when we build a program as big and complex as clusters, what happens at the end of that? How do we transfer equity to those who want it or to those who need it? And how, we do, how do we decide who those people are? Who is we? Ultimately, my work centers around creating space for conversation between listening and understanding and the power of change that that process brings. That's what brings me to this panel today. Thank you, Tony. So happy to, to have you here with us. Um, Francesca? Hi, everyone. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much for making this possible and for inviting me to be a part of this space. I'm already listening and learning so much already. I'm really excited to be able to be in conversation with everyone here. Um, my name is Francesca. I'm a Black woman of mixed heritage. I have near to shoulder length hair at the moment that's sort of tucked behind my ears and um, in, a, in a bobble to the to my right shoulder and um, I'm wearing a navy jumpsuit which is super comfy and it's covered with lots of colourful shapes and squiggles which are kind of 90s in style and I'm wearing some glasses and um, which are quite large on my face and the top half of them is navy and the bottom half of them is white and um, my pronouns are she and her and I'm a lecturer in digital media studies at Cardiff University and a lot of the work that I do involves addressing questions to do with power, questions to do with the marketplace and processes that involve the commodification and often the distortion of issues to do with injustice and activism. 
And some of the work that I've been doing for the last several years includes a project with independent researcher, writer and organiser Leila Roxanne Hill, which focuses on black history and black lives in Scotland. So we've been working on a book called Black Out Here, Black Lives in Scotland, which should be out next year. And that's involved a mixture of interviews, archive based research and reflecting on some of our own experiences and the experiences of those close to us too. Today, I was thinking that something I'll probably end up reflecting on involves questions to do with power, health and care. And um, so I've been dealing with the ongoing impact of what's been referred to as long COVID or the, the sort of so-called long hauler experience. And that has involved me thinking a lot about the different ways that conversations to do with the pandemic and COVID and its impact on different people in society um, seldom involve critical questions to do with power, to do with um, knowledge and to do with whose experiences are not being accounted for um, by different institutions, what care means for various people who don't have access to some of the services that others do, and how we can think about the pandemic um, in more critical ways that involves an emphasis on the experiences of different people from marginalised groups, including those who have perhaps had COVID themselves um, and are dealing with the ongoing impact of it, which the healthcare system is still trying to catch up on um, as well. So yeah, I just want to really echo all of what's been said, really looking forward to conversations to do today to do with power. And um, I would say as part of that, I'm always interested in the dynamics between Britain's constitutive nations, as I've spent most of my life in the devolved nations of Scotland and Wales. So that might be part of some of what we end up speaking about today too. Francesca, thank you so much. Can't wait for your new book to be published. I will definitely be supporting you. Um, over to you, Keith. Thank you. Um, hello, and uh, my name is Keith Hebden, pronouns he, him. And I'm uh, now realizing underdressed in a, a, an orange jumper and um, shiny headed. Uh, a colleague says that I look like a human version of Olaf the Snowman, uh, if that's helpful. So um, just the eyebrows, essentially. Um, and uh, great to be with you from here at home to wherever you are, Bristol or elsewhere, or watching this on YouTube afterwards. Um, I come to this from a, a range of backgrounds, including an ex, as an ex-vicar in the Church of England, a former school teacher, but also um, involved in direct action and the peace movement. So breaking into places and marching and what have you. And it was great and fun, but I got frustrated with two things. Uh, one is that it, everyone looked like me, and the other was that we never won anything. So I now work uh, on what's called broad-based community organizing with Citizens UK. And we develop leaders for public life and build people-powered organizations in local communities. So we have uh, just over 500 um, faith, education, union, and community groups working in 18 local chapters uh, on issues such as um, th there are parks that are unsafe and we need to make them safer. Um, right the way up to um, settling the status of refugees in Britain and to making misogyny a hate crime uh, and with a home of the living wage. So we, we believe that you get the justice that you have the power to compel, um, that being on the side of morality and right isn't enough, but we need power. And we prefer relational power uh, as a way to get things done. So we build relational power uh, in order to win stuff. So I'm really excited to be with you to be talking about this word and to be talking creatively about it because I want to learn how to be more creative in how I think about the expression of people power. Thank you so much and I guess this is a very nice segue into our um, our prompts. So when we were thinking about the Hopeful Future seminar series, um, the, the team that was involved in the design were thinking about what would be most useful um, to discuss and what, what is also current. And actually I was the person that made the suggestion of discussing relational power. And I must say that the phrase itself was something that I learned from when I attended training um, that was given by Citizens UK that was delivered by Keith. And I loved putting a phrase to something that I have been involved in and that I've seen, especially um, racialized people and um, you know, marginalized people doing, which is building within communities. So just to kind of give an explanation about what we mean when we say relational power, it is literally about harnessing the power in, in, in relationships and in networks and kind of focusing that towards making change within communities. 
that are usually historically um, excluded and marginalized. So with that being said, I'm going to um, open the floor to our um, panelists and we'll hopefully go in the same order. So Khadija, Tony, Francesca and Keith. And I'm going to start by asking a really basic question, but I think that it's useful in the context of this conversation so that we can set a reference point. So my question to you all is when we say power, what do we mean by it? How does this power manifest in our lives on the daily? And then what is power in the creative sector and you know, in creative technology? So kind of thinking about who gets to define what it is, what are its constraints? How does this so-called concept of ambivalence of power also play its role in this conversation? Um, so feel free to you know, answer as and, and give as much or as little information as you are comfortable to. So over to you again, Khadija. Thank you. Um, although you've sort of framed this as a basic question, I don't think it's a basic question at all. I think, you know, arguments about power have been going on for, for millennia. Um, thinking through what power is, how power manifests, how power is held, how power is maintained is a question that I often ask myself. Um, and it often forces me to settle on not necessarily what power is, um, not even necessarily who has power, but also how do we think about power? And actually, how do we become so mystified to power that we're often unconcerned with what power is and how and who um, has this power? Um, I think about the fact that every human in their own right has a form of power and how we interact, how we engage within society. I think about my politics. I think about the power of the people being a central focus of how I understand my engagement with the world and then I think about with knowing that a populace of people, subjugated people, people who exist in general and anywhere in society, who hold the mass of power, yet seem to not know that they have this power. What is what is the outcome of that? What is the effects of that? Um, and that forces me to think about our socialization. Um, and as someone who's interested in education, as someone who's interested in sort of the development of people from childhood to adulthood, I think about how every day um, of our lives from when we're born is essentially a, a sort of negotiation with the various types of power we have. I think about from primary school, from nursery even, um, to, to university, the constant need in the way in which we engage within the education system to be told that we don't have power, right? Um, when we exist in schools, we're often sort of socialized into thinking that power isn't something that we as the populace of students who often, you know, are far more, are far greater than, for example, the teacher, um, it's, it's not something that we hold, but it's something the one individual in the front holds against us. Um, and that makes me think about the sort of like advent of neoliberalism, the sort of um, kind of crisis of individuality and individualism and how we've gotten to the point where we are so used to seeing power as something that is owned by so many, so few that we're often sort of passively recipient to the effects of those who have this power. Um, so I guess that's, that's kind of where I'm sitting with this. And I'm still thinking through how I understand that, what that means and, um, and how I can maybe unpack this further. So I'm looking forward to sort of other people's contributions to how they understand power. And then I'll sort of think through more along the lines of how I think about the sort of de-socialization of power, the de-radicalization of power from something that is owned by a populace into something that is held by just a few. Khadija, thank you so much. That was powerful. <laughs> no pun intended. Thank you very much. Um, Tony? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've been thinking about this question all week, like, because um, we, we were chatting about it. I was like, what, do, what is power? And <clears throat> I spent a lot of this week thinking about how kind of power is the ability to create or affect change. Um, and kind of change could be in a space of policy, or it could be in your communities, or it could be in the way that things are distributed, or the way that resources are shared. Um, but then I got to thinking as well about the whole other side of exactly the same coin, which is the power to, to not create change and the power to maintain status quo um, and the power to make sure that the power that exists stays where it is and rather than shifting it about. So this kind of this real duality, actually, power is all about ripping things up and completely starting again and starting from scratch, but also about the exact, exact opposite thing at the same time. Um, and actually, the kind of the power balances that we talk about are the kind of the space between the two how is it how does which shift from one side to the other or from one group to another and who is empowered and who has the autonomy to create change or not create change thank you tony francesca 
Yeah, I was just thinking about the relational nature of, of power, which, which everyone's been speaking about. And I suppose some thoughts I had was the different ways that power, depending on what type of power we're speaking about and um, who's involved, which institutions, but sometimes the ways we see that um, power morphs or, you know, in one situation, somebody who is dealing with marginalization, structural oppression, and um, in another situation, they might actually find that they're in a relative position of power. And um, so I was thinking about the fact that sometimes conversations to do with power, to do with inequality, to do with oppression, don't account for the fact that people from groups that are referred to as marginalized and minoritized and who deal with oppression can also have power relative um, to others as well, and sometimes can also oppress themselves. So just being mindful of the fact that for me, power rarely um, perhaps it ever can be viewed as fixed. Um, but I was also thinking about the relationship between power and agency and words like empowerment and how they move throughout consumer culture and marketing and what it means when we hear people say that they're speaking on behalf of those um, who, who they claim don't have a voice or claim don't have the ability to express their experiences on their own terms. So I suppose maybe a question I was mulling over is what does it mean to acknowledge when people experience forms of oppression, when people don't have access to forms of power, but when they nonetheless definitely do have agency that they express, but which is perhaps not recognised or is obstructed by others. Thank you so much. And also thank you for bringing up the concept of people positioning themselves as the so-called voice of the voiceless. That keeps happening in, in um, you know, activist circles. And it's, it's frustrating to see people build whole ca careers and you know, get funding um, to speak over people that they claim they, they care about, isn't it? Um, over to you, Keith. Yeah, it, well, it's tempting, isn't it, as well to, um, I, I often hear people speaking on behalf of others in a very kind of like protective kind of way uh, with the assumption that, that um, that though the other they're speaking for can't take risks, uh, uh, isn't capable of understanding the risks or can't take the risks and, and that there's something even immoral about. Uh, uh, so we end up advocacy, advocating as a default um, and it's no good. <laughs> it's no good in more, almost every case. Um, I've, got a, I've just finished reading a book by um, Alicia Garza, who was one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, just finished it a couple of days ago. And I'm, I'm a big fan of like, Quotes and she's incredibly quotable. Um, and her definition, or one of her definitions of power, is almost identical to the one actually that Tony said just now. Um, she says, Power is the ability to impact and affect the conditions of your own life and the lives of others. So, I mean, in the briefest sense, power is the ability to act, but she expands that is the, the ability to impact and affect conditions, like acting it with purpose, if you like. Bayard Rustin, um, it's the ability to make things, uh, make the unworkable things workable. Um, so uh, Bayard Rustin being one of the civil rights organizers, um, without whom uh, much of the civil rights movement, the uh, Million Person March would never would have happened, for example. Um, so a great thinker and writer on power. Um, so, uh, so our understanding of power and the relational power we've all been talking about, I think is, uh, it's, there's the taboo around power because we normally understand it, I think, in terms of positional power. And also because um, so many people who have power, and I think Francesca, you alluded to this, um, uh, is um, it's not transparent because they don't like to admit they have it. And we have a culture and we have it ministers, you know, in government, ministers to serve. And people like to pretend they don't have power and they're just there to serve and to help others. And, and power that is um, denied is power that's unaccountable. So uh, one of the important thing is simply to name power, isn't it? It's simply to um, state where it is. Um, but, uh, but again, Francesca, your point about um, power being relative and not fixed uh, relative to who and where, um, I think it's one of those important things we need to always do is to think about powers in that relative way. We often talk about a structure analysis, a power structure analysis. Um, union organizers like um, Jane McAlevey, uh, who worked with hospitals in, in Las Vegas, always talks about like the structure and it depends what the issue is as to where the power lies, because we all have abilities to act in different contexts. Um, but recognizing uh, these two different types of power 
and that power over is sometimes appropriate to use, like uh, a surgeon. I am quite happy for a surgeon with a certain degree of authority to have power over my life in a way that I wouldn't let other people, for example. But I volunteer for that. <laughs> um, but the power with, the relational power, uh, coming that whole thing of, um, of going back again to Tony's point of, of knowing who's it for and did you even ask them? Like, why isn't it with instead of for? Um, and I, I work a lot with schools, Khadija, so I was recognizing what you were saying about, because I often ask children, like they've been elected to uh, school councils or what have you. And I asked them, you know, you're elected to school council, isn't that great? And they say, yeah. And I said, okay, what power do you have? And they're like, um, <laughs> and they know, like they know they're just playing the game. <laughs> they know they don't really have power. So I love to see young people have real power. Uh, and they're incredible negotiators. School pupils are incredible negotiators with council leaders and businesses. Because they often have no or little positional power, they know how to work in a relational way and how to negotiate from a position where they have to rely on the we that they stand alongside. I just find that always really exciting because like you, I share that frustration <laughs> with the game we play about power, uh, uh, particularly in schools. Um, I'll leave it there for now perhaps. Thank you so much. I see that Tony wants to add something. It's more of just a question to Keith, actually. I was really interested in what you were saying then about this idea of risk and not understanding the risks. Um, and it's actually language that I use, which is might be quite uh, contradictory to what you're saying there, of the need to underwrite risk for people. Um, and kind of, especially in the, the example that you're giving with uh, with school kids there and on the school council. I remember that I was on the school council and every, every month we'd go in with the same set of demands and every month we'd come back out with none of them having been there. Um, but also I was not in charge of any of the budgets or of any of the, none of the ramifications of it were gonna, were gonna come back to me. I'd be really interested just in what your thoughts were on kind of, a, yes, there's an understanding of risk, but then there's also a kind of a responsibility to those risks if you get into a position of positional power. That's a terrible sentence. <laughs> um, before I, I yeah. hand it over to Keith, I can just see that Khadija has her hand up as well um, and was yeah. nodding when you were speaking, Tony. So perhaps Khadija, do you want to add on your question now? Before Keith um, I actually wanted to sort of reference something that Francesca said, so I'm happy for Tony and Keith to uh -huh. sort of work with each other and I'll pick it up. Perfect. So over to you, Keith. So I think, so Makalevi again, she says that um, your people, talking to union organisers, your people are made of clay, not glass, so that we don't treat them as fragile. But at the same time, I totally don't mean we should um, either utilise or, or have a nest but people should know what the risks are mitigate them as much as they can but they should let people in you know uh, on the expectations we could lose uh on on what's at stake and then and then to let people decide their own whether or not to take those risks and i think in advocacy models of justice work uh, we often hide the risks uh, and then don't let people make that decision for themselves so um i've worked for example with homelessness charities where We've had homeless people negotiating directly with power holders and had some resistance from some of the homelessness charities to say, oh, well, you know, what if they don't win? What if what if they don't turn up? And all those kind of like, um, what about their mental health? And, and all of that stuff is really important, but that's a conversation to have with the person who is homeless, not with me. <laughs> so that's where we have the conversation. That's really, thank you, Keith. Thank you both. Yeah, actually, um, I'm thinking through some of what you've been saying, Keith, and, and this sort of links into the, the point that Francesca made that I thought was really astute um, in the, the the way in which we think about, about power is often fixed as something that only a few people hold and that it can never transform and can never be transferred in different contexts. Um, and I think about um, specifically the paternalism that comes about through that use of, of, of power in that way, the notion of representative power in a particular way being held by a particular group of people who then have the power to speak for, speak over, speak you know, through, um, through others. Um, and in this sort of analysis of power that I've been thinking about, um, it's been it's been quite challenging because I think there are particular discourses of power that have become somewhat naturalized in our everyday life, right? These are things that 
often had a good home, often came from a right place, sort of the notion of privilege, the notion of checking one's privilege. But then in the current sort of age, I found have become demorphed into a performative gesture rather than an actual um, um, interrogation of power, more than an actual understanding of power and its intersections, um, an understanding of power and how it shifts and it sort of moves. I remember I was in a talk recently um, about colonization and the sort of ways in which colonization was this sort of mammoth sort of um, injustice. Um, and I remember being sort of impassioned and really angry about the way in which we talk about oppression and someone sort of stopping me and, 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 and reminding me that sometimes the language we use around talking about oppressed people can be in and of itself quite dehumanizing. It can be dehumanizing because we take on this role of oppression as this fixture, as this thing that is just done to people, as this thing that people don't actively fight against. Um, and she mentioned that, you know, colonialism, even in how we think about it, was not a just there were always resistances. There's always been resistances. And the community and relational power, as it exists within the community, is often the space in which we see those kind of fights. We see those antagonisms. We see that pushing back against the sort of structural power that we become so naturalized to thinking about as fixed, that we often force ourselves into these sort of entrapments, right? If we think that the world can't change because structural power has a particular history, has a particular materiality, has a particular sort of back Backing, then we can also, in, in some instances, succumb to it, right? Um, and I'm thinking here of Francesca saying, almost sometimes accepting our, our oppression passively and not recognizing that actually their resistances in everyday movements, their resistances in everyday discourses, their resistances in everyday actions that seek to chip away at the structure. So thinking about how power, although we tend to think of it in these large sort of juggernaut-esque ways, um, can be shifted and can be challenged in very small ways. We can chip at power, um, we can move power, we can transform power, um, and structural does not mean that the structure cannot be changed. The structural just is an image, it's a symbolic sort of way in which we think about power, but is not the fixture of it. Thank you so much, Deej. Um, just to kind of pick up on something that you and both Keith talked about. So Keith was talking about power that has no accountability and you were talking about acknowledgement of privilege. And just to, I guess, share one of my reflect pers personal reflections is you know I've been in some settings where um, we analyze our privilege and we say well you know I stand before you but I can't speak um, to all the basically like to everything because I have a limited range because these are my privileges and da 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 da, da. and I, while I do think that that is useful and I will continue to do that I've been questioning myself um, what well what happens next what <laughs> you know, the acknowledgement of my privilege in this particular room, yes, that is necessary, but, but what action am I taking to ensure that people who don't have these privileges are, um, are, are held and you know, have access to the resources and opportunities that I do? Um, I, I, and it's kind of this thing about like face without action, right? So I'm just here speaking in front of you and acknowledging, and then I'm going back to my privilege and leaving you in the same state as I found you. And it, is that actually just, you know? So I definitely agree that the concept of accountability and um, assessing our, our positionality, very, very useful, but I don't think that they are enough. Um, so it's fantastic to, to, to see and unexpected for me to hear that both of you, you know, would, would highlight this. Um, so uh, yes, do you want to speak to that as yeah, well? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that that's absolutely the sort of position that I've been in, in this sort of last year, thinking about specifically symbolisms mm -hmm. um, and how often so many of the ways in which we're challenging power end up as symbolic gestures, which are in a, I wouldn't even call them accountability process. They're not even, in, they're, they're kind of a mild acknowledgement without the actual thing of accountability, right? Being mm -hmm. the action. They're an acknowledgement of power, but uh, a refusal to, to actually give it up you know a refusal to actually transform it a refusal to actually um and and part of the sort of frustration I've come at is that because we are so mystified to power as an action and we think about power as sort of an embodied existence we think it's enough to say that we embody the, the existence of particular types of power but not enough to actually act on that power and give that power up great so I think you know when you said this now what has occurred to me is I think thinking about accountability I myself have stripped it of its um, action points. 
So I think in many ways, I've thought of accountability as acknowledgement. And as you said, they're two totally different things. We're mildly acknowledging certain things, but accountability has to be, has to go beyond that mild acknowledgement and has to um, encompass actions towards justice. Um, so with that being said, I think we can kind of focus a little bit more on relational power and about how we build that. And we do have a little bit of time. So it would be great to hear about, um, you know, your experiences, if you're happy to share about um, any case studies from your activism, from your work, from your lives, where you have been able to harness and build relational power. What, what does it look like? What are challenges that um, you have faced? What are challenges that you can see are perhaps broad spectrum? Um, so I wonder who wants to go first. I don't want to point at anybody now. I'll have a go at sharing some thoughts. It's, it's maybe one of, one of those responses which connects the question but goes off in a slightly different direction as well. I suppose there's maybe two things that come to mind. One was thinking about relational power um, as, as part of how people have experienced the pandemic and, and what it means, for example, to so something that's frustrated me a lot has been you know, discussions and discourse that puts forward this idea that everybody's been impacted in the same way and that everybody has been inside the whole time or able to, to zoom into wherever they, they need to um, and that anybody who has you know be, been affected by COVID and has survived it and um, you know is, isn't dealing with the, the ongoing effects of that and what I think about the dynamic between relational power and perhaps the pandemic and how it is discussed is it, it comes back to some of these questions about um, you know who has who, who has the power to sort of shape the dominant narrative um, whether that is institutions, whether that's thinking about the, the difference between how the pandemic is discussed in the press and in political spheres at a grassroots level. So something I'm really interested in is how we've seen individuals, for example, dealing with what has been referred to as long COVID and um, having to, to essentially, you know, push and share their experiences, share their knowledge because of the, the denial of the, the, the fact that this was even a thing, you know, last March, when I was speaking to people, the, the language that we have right now, which is certainly far from necessarily being that, that helpful, wasn't even around. And people were still being told to take more vitamins and try and get more sleep. So I was reflecting on relational power and the ability to contribute to or shape different uh, messages, conversations, and also beyond that, who is then most likely to be listened to and responded to and, and taken seriously. And the other example I was thinking about, which is maybe less at the, the level of individual experiences, was just the different conversations to do with power within Britain between um, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. So something that's definitely very much a common part of the Scottish context, the Welsh context, is this complete denial um, of their, their role, their involvement in forms of oppression and, you know, the, the, their connections to different matters to do with imperialism, colonialism and how this these ideas to do with relational power can perhaps in some cases be weaponized to sort of deny um, the, the fact that people or places, again, can be, ha have access to power, can be powerful, but can also be impacted by, by different forms um, of, of oppression too, depending on, on where we're dealing with and who we're dealing with. And the last thing I was going to say, which I felt, you know, everybody's been speaking about and, and I've been thinking about um, all of what everyone's been sharing, but there can be these expectations about what power looks like, who looks um, powerful and, you know, the, this trap of maybe sort of representation politics um, can feed into that. Whereas I feel what we're all saying is, you know, power it is shape shifts, it's not fixed, um, it is fluid, and it's it's not this um, one entity that can really be comprehended in the way that is often suggested. Thank you so much, Francesca. Uh, Khadija? Um, I don't know if this is sort of a divergent point, um, but I'm remembering something Francesca mentioned earlier, which I'm fundamentally interested in my research as well, um, thinking about sort of the logics of marketization and the logics of commodification. Um, and there's this term that um, is kind of found grounded in, in sort of Marxist analysis of, of, of capital. Um, but um, a friend of mine has been helping me think through um, in, in relation to how we think about relational power and specifically how particular types of symbolic and 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 representational sort of articulations of, of a radical form of power 
exist within the sort of like framework of, of, of commodity and their existence within the framework of commodity has done something very crude to how we think about politics and how we think about relational politics. Because we can talk about relational politics as it's situated in a community, as it's situated in any community. But for me, it's not just about any individual community, right? It's about then solidarity beyond the sort of community-based understandings of our oppressions. Um, and her analysis is very much that in the sort of age where, you know, if we think back to last year where we had an uprising, where we had black radical imagery be front and center in everyone's imaginations and the sort of tradition of black, black radicalism really take foot and take ground. We saw what was a commodification of that radicalism, right? We saw, um, you know, Boohoo who have slave factories all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> saying they care about the black community and, and, and posting sort of posters of black fists up. Um, and then you had a sort of counter sort of reaction, which was a lot of, um, and if we think back to this, the Sarah Everard protest, um, there was a sort of uproar about, you know, fists in the air and like, no, fists in the air is something that's owned by Black Rad the Black radical tradition, so you're not allowed to use that. Um, and I was thinking, well, this is absurd because the fist in the air is a historical working class sort of um, articulation of power for the people. Um, it has various histories and genealogies and it's been adopted by various movements. But why are people concerned with symbolism becoming commodified? Why, why do people care that it was being used in a, um, a, a women's rights march? Why do, why do people care? Why are people saying that it's something that belongs to black people and, and should actually symbolisms of radicalism belong to any group? Um, and she articulated that we have to understand that in the current stage in which we're at, where we're forced to think about the resources we have as inherently limited um, and forced to think about things as quite disposable, people assume that unless you can have authentic claim to a particular type of imagery, you can't have an authentic claim to a particular type of oppression. And that's where we're at, where we think about relational power in the context of a particular, often narrow group of people, but not beyond the borders of that and not beyond our conceptualization of of relational power as something that is beyond ownership, something that is a solidarity based action, something that goes beyond the need to view ourselves as distinct and our oppressions as distinct, whilst that being important, they're also inherently interconnected. Because when we think about the larger structures of power, we understand that power is mobilized in various ways, we are disciplined in various ways, often by the state. And so our attempts to create and coalesce our power needs to come through a recognition of the difference, but, an, a, but a commitment to the, the, the solidarity action, a commitment to each other, a commitment to understanding that our oppressors may not be the same, our oppression may not be the same, but our fight for power is so much more effective if we understand the beast that we're coming up against is often similar. And I'm just thinking about that in relation to the commodity fetishism of, of, of symbolism, forcing us to think about power in fixed ways, even when they are relational. Um, and thinking about how we push past that, how we push past the notion of community as fixed into community as a coalition of various people. Um, Emma Dabiri's book has a great, great, great analysis of what exactly coalition building as a form of power building can look like and what it is. Thank you so much, Khadija. Um, I'm wondering, Tony or Keith, if you have anything that you would like to add, Keith? Uh, yes, please. And also to say, Khadija, could you put the link to that book in the chat, maybe? You? Thanks, uh, I'd like to read that. So um, just to tell a very local story, if that's okay, of some building of relational power to win some justice, um, which goes back to when I was working in Nottinghamshire in Mansfield and Ashfield, and we had 20 member institutions of our Mourn Valley citizens, so mostly churches and schools by and large. And uh, nearly all of them in the town of Mansfield, but two of them on their own, part of the alliance in the neighbouring town of Ashfield. And there was a road, the A38, where a child had been killed and six seriously injured with broken bones. And for years on their own, uh, with a little positional power they had, uh, uh, the, but with a good local knowledge, the school and the church hadn't managed to get the road to be made safe. Highways said that um, they said that it wouldn't be classified as a dangerous road unless three people died. And then they couldn't do anything until it was classified as a dangerous road. And the council said, it's, we have no power to act here, it's highways. So uh, they ran a listening campaign and they built relationships between those two institutions and across with the rest of the Alliance. So they got to know each other. That was the important first step. And then they came up with three things they wanted. They wanted a, a bigger central reservation, a change in the phase of the lights, and they wanted to change the speed limit around that junction. 
Uh, they took seven leaders to meet the council leader, uh, explained everything to him, and he said, there's nothing I can do. I have no power here. And they said, no, we've decided you have got power. Uh, you're the guy who can do this. Will you come have a think, do some research, come and meet us again at our accountability assembly? And he turns up in front of 450 people. Uh, a church leader explains the situation. A 12-year-old girl talks very sensitively about her friend who died at that road. And they reminded him of the three things they wanted. And um, just before he was given a chance to respond, yes or no, uh, 40 primary school children had made lollipop signs. They came and walked in through the middle of the room, uh, up to the front in absolute silence, surrounded the dais, the stage, and the church warden pointed to them and said, these are the children who cross this road every day. Now, will you, and reiterated the three asks. Um, apparently he swore under his breath, according to another teacher uh, that was there, um, because he, he, he was held accountable, uh, not only to the 450 people who were there, but to the relationships those 450 people had with their sending organizations. These are permanent relationships. They committed membership views to one another in this People's Alliance, this coalition. And um, within less than five weeks, the diggers were out and we won two out of three of those asks. But also, we didn't lose the relationship with the decision maker. So that council leader worked with, uh, with us in Nottingham as well on other things. And we had a good relationship there. We didn't lose one for the sake of the other. Uh, which makes me just want to end with talking about power and the idea of zero sum and non-zero sum power. Uh, those with positional power often fall into the habit of thinking of power as zero sum. That if the people have power, I must have less. But power is the ability to act. We want our politicians to act. Uh, we don't want them to become powerless. We just want them to act with us instead of over us. So we want to give them the power from us to lend it to them for the action and give it, take it back <laughs> again. Um, but we want to build power together. Uh, and, and if we see power as non-zero sum, as simply increasing our ability to act together, I think we have a healthy idea of power and less protective and more willing to build, uh, build diverse power. That is a brilliant example, Keith. Thank you so much for sharing that. The, the image of it is great in my head. Um, I think the idea of it not being zero sum and kind of how we come together to produce power is a really important uh, part of change and an important part of implementing new processes or uh, developing new products or policies or whatever it might be. <coughs> um, I always, I always think that when you get a group of people in the room, they're so, they're so. In developing relational power, what you're doing is developing relationships, and the part of that is the development of trust. Um, I talk a lot about being the need to be deeply honest about what it is that you're trying to achieve and what capacity and resources that you have to get to that point. Um, I think it's very easy to go in and be like, oh, we're just going to completely change the world, when actually maybe your resources aren't available to do that. Maybe you haven't got the right person with the right bit of positional power in the room to do that. But what you can do is start to build towards those things. Um, I have a theory for how you hear me go on about this all the time. I call it the skate park hypothesis. And that is, so I developed this in years of youth engagement, working with young people, asking them what they want from their communities, what they need from their streets, what they need from the grown-ups, if you like. Um, and kind of the, the stock response is always that, oh, we really like a skate park. And uh, regardless of whether or not any of them skate or have any intention of skating or are gonna start doing it anytime soon. And it's this kind of, a lack of understanding or a lack of awareness of the power that they have within them and kind of what the what resources are available to them to create change what change could look like um so there has to be a space in there for conversation before we can start to generate power about about the power like a meta conversation around what it is that we're trying to achieve and what we can achieve and which people do we need in the room who do we whose ear do we need to get hold of and to bring them in so that we can have that bit of positional power to create the change that we're trying to create i just wanted to really bring that story up that was all Thank you so much, everyone. Um, these are really powerful case studies that you've presented and shared with us here. Um, before I ask our final question, just to say, because um, we have a couple of minutes left to have a discussion amongst us as panelists, and then we're going to be opening the floor up for any questions from our audience members. So if you have any questions, please do feel free to put them in the hosts and panelists channel 
or if you have any comments that you want to um, just add to the discussion, um, feel free to put those in the everyone channel. Um, so I wonder, Keith, Tony, Khadija, Francesca, do you have any questions to ask each other? I was just thinking about something um, in response to what Tony was just saying there. So it's maybe this could be a question or it was just a thought, but I was thinking about that that point to do with you know, people saying like we want a skateboard. Um, and I was also thinking, I guess, another way to maybe look at it is that thinking about the power to make changes also involves thinking about changes that could be fun and playful and I suppose sometimes when we speak about power or we speak about change there can be quite fixed ideas about um, what that might look like and what that might involve but I also I guess yeah I'm always excited at the prospect of 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 change in, involving sort of the um, changes at the everyday level that create more space and um, for for play fun and enjoyment but I also completely agree with what you're saying about not, not wanting people to feel limited and um, to 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 what they, what changes they could make if they were asked you know you could make any change you want I absolutely agree Fanya. I'm, I'm all about more fun and more enjoyment in our especially in our local communities and things like that I think what I mean is that there has to be space for conversation about what is it what were the drivers that led somebody to to ask for that and what what it comes down to is a space to be um, a space for community a space to build new relationships and build relational power that's the kind of spaces where those things happen um so it's kind of yeah developing the space for people to share those ideas and start mm -hmm. from the space of people's experiences so that we can understand the drivers behind mm -hmm. what they're making people say those things and then we can work backwards from that as well if it's mm -hmm. not a skate park what could it look like mm -hmm. to have an indoor community space mm -hmm. what could it look like to have um, a panel as part of the local council where young people get to influence change mm -hmm. i mean that kind of more kind of a, mm -hmm. like through the, the more regular channels of power or whatever mm. that might be um, but yeah I'm, I'm all for it I'm not yeah. against escape. yeah yeah I, I, I knew you would be I was also just thinking <laughs> one final thing to do with this I feel like what you shared also brings up really important questions to do with architecture and space and I know yep. throughout the pandemic there has been and uh, you know I went to um, Waverley Station for the first time in ages and um, when, when going back to Scotland and, and so much of the, the seating area had been removed and there have been lots of changes that have been made and um, at the time and um, you know based on claims that it was to do with upholding social distancing but we have seen changes being made that have also become more permanent and have made it more difficult for people and um, to, to find spaces to come together and, and to, to find spaces to be in, in public space so I think also just all of what everybody was speaking about was making me think about relational power not only in terms of people but also places in the architecture space and what makes that space more accessible or inaccessible or also hostile towards certain groups too. Yeah yeah I just want to quickly pick up on a comment um, that was made by Victoria Okoye, who said, I love this idea of change that is playful and joyful. And I kind of want to signpost people to one of Watershed's projects. Um, it's called Playable City. It's a project that has been uh, active for a number of years and then kind of work on it stopped for a couple of years. And we were looking to uh, reanimate it. And then obviously with the lockdown, you know, things kind of... Um, paused and our our trajectory had to change obviously because our relationship to public spaces has changed you know now in this pandemic and thinking about public health thinking about even touching things that are outside and in order to reanimate this playable city which is all about creating um using creative tech to um kind of enhance the the, 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 pl the playfulness of ordinary objects that you would find outside. So I pause there and I give an example. For instance, one of the prototypes was um, people passing under a, a lamppost and um, gadgets in the lamppost, uh, capturing their shadows and then kind of shining them back onto the ground. You can see that I'm really not a creative technologist with my description, but people then had the chance to, to dance. And that project is called Hello Lamppost. So dancing with their own shadows, you know, underneath a lamppost, beautiful. Um, and that was a couple of years ago. So these are the kind of projects that we were funding. And in order to be sensitive to the change that has happened, not just with the pandemic, but also with what has happened um, with BLM in Bristol particularly, we brought together a diverse group of individuals within our network to ask ourselves some questions about how we could responsibly bring this project back to life. So, you know, kind of taking what you've all said and with Victoria's comment is, we're really hoping that in the projects going forward that we implement 
we build on our own relational power and we really listen to the people in our community so that we are not just enforcing our way and kind of saying, oh, this has worked in the past, we're going to do it in the future. So we had loads of questions um, and, and about six themes that came up through this three-day consultation process um, that, uh, the individuals that were in that cohort of people that we spoke to, um, they made these suggestions and we are now going to use these suggestions to shape our calls in the future. So I just, I, I don't think I thought about it when we were, when we were um, you know, hosting that workshop. I, I did not think about it in terms of relational power, but that is very much an example. So can I ask one of my colleagues, if you could please go to the Playable City website and go to the Creative Labs. It would be our Playable City Artist Labs. And if you could put a link in the chat, just in case anyone is interested in picking up on, on that project. Um, but thank you so much, everyone. I'm just gonna go through and have a look because we have some questions that have come uh, have come in. So Joe Lansdowne, who's the exec producer at Pervasive Media Studio and my line manager. Hi, Joe. Um, says, Faraha talked a bit about creative technology in the overview. And I was wondering, do the panel have any reflections on technology? Perhaps, um, just sorry, my laptop is a little bit slow. Perhaps particularly in the way that it configures networks and relationships and relational power. Kadija? Um, so in the sort of advent of, of the COVID pandemic, we saw a lot of sort of physical spaces somewhat disappear and, and transform in, in various ways. And I think one of the, one of the ways in which for me, um, the physical space then became part of a digital space was was quite important, quite significant. Um, the way in which I was able to create community outside of a physical space, I think was very, very important for my survival within the pandemic um, and for the survival of many. Um, and I'm also thinking back to the protest um, I organized a few of the, the Manchester protests for Black Lives Matter. Um, and outside of my ability to physically coalesce in the ways that I would have traditionally done if I wanted to do sort of like a big protest, the digital space was, was so helpful in building that power, so helpful in communicating a message to a mass of people very quickly, very effectively, um, and building up on the relationships that I had with other people who lived in, the, who, who had created their lives in a digital space. And we were able to sort of very successfully um, basically create these massive protests that were amazing. Um, but the, the, there are also some challenges um, with that sort of idea of, of, of digital spaces and digital lives. And I think Francesca actually mentioned it earlier that we actually forget who's missing from these conversations when we think about our ability to access things like, you know, good frequent internet, um, a decent laptop that can stream. And I know so many people who didn't have that, not even as a privilege, who just did not have the material access or the resources to be able to find solace in the types of communities that we had, who had their public and outdoor spaces taken away from them, but that wasn't then replaced with an online space. And so I think about in the sort of shift to a, a sort of culture of, 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 of more sort of very digital technologies, we also have to think about access. We also have to think about resources. We have to think about the fact that there were so many young people who had no access to education during the pandemic because they didn't have access to things like good internet and didn't have access to things like laptops, um, didn't have access to the technology that they needed to be able to, to even view them, to even engage in a world in a kind of meaningful way when the world had completely transformed overnight. Um, so whilst the digital space, whilst technology has offered us just accessible advances um, and very accessible for many people who had never been included in discussions before there are also many people who were left behind and I think this again speaks to Francesca's point about in one instance one can have power and that can so in instantly be transformed to where they have no power in one instance being able to be physically present in a space offered you a particular type of power but then as, as quickly as it as existed um, not having a digital life not having a digital imprint not having the resources to have that sort of life also impacted people significantly. Thank you so much. Any other comments from our panelists about technology and relational power, Francesca? I was going to say I completely agree with, with all of what Katija was saying and, and, and earlier on and throughout this whole conversation. And I was also just thinking about, you know, when we see platforms um, go down for a period of time. So I think, um, I mean, time, what is that at this point? What was it? Was it last week or whenever it was when Facebook, WhatsApp, um, that day I was um, teaching a module to do a meme culture and digital remix culture. And we were thinking about speculative fiction and speculating several hours before about 
what happens if, if the internet's down for everybody for a day or what would the world be like if um, access to everything was free everybody had the material conditions to be able to engage in these different ways so mm -hmm. just to then see what happened and um, later on in, in the evening I think it really speaks to all of what Katija was just saying there which is you know these questions to do with um, power to do with the digital we can't disconnect that from questions to do with material conditions and the fact that for the spaces that that are available um, to some people, there, there will always be issues in terms of being able to participate in them for others. So something I think we saw a lot of was this uncritical push by institutions, academic and political ones towards this, you know, more digital overnight. You, you need to, to be able to have a digital device to contact a GP. You need to be able to have a digital device and um, to, to access these resources which are essential to your survival. And it's worrying actually to, to think about the long term impact of that when even though, you know, we're in a different situation than we were 12 months ago, Mm -hmm. I still think a lot of changes that have been pushed through um, are, are going to last a lot longer than, than has maybe been suggested from the start. Thank you so much, Keith. So I, I think there's, there's two uh, equal and opposite dangers. And I think Francesca's uh, referenced them already there. That one is the danger, like, so people have been online long before the lockdown because they couldn't be out of their homes for one reason or another. And suddenly we were, we, for ages, we couldn't join them like, uh, or we couldn't bring them in and suddenly we could, suddenly we, we found we could after all. And then as lockdown ends and we start going offline and on site again, uh, the da one danger is we leave them again. <laughs> uh, and the other danger is those that um, Khadija and Francesco talked about, that those who, are, um, those who aren't online at all uh, and, and who, like if we come with online solutions, uh, can't access those. And, We've been working a bit on that with digital inclusion stuff, making sure people have the tech and, and the broadband uh, as much as we can. Uh, and there's loads of people doing great work on that. But I think the real solution is the local and the relationship that all politics is personal, to, to find ways to create physical spaces where people can gather and access to tech together, shared tech. That, um, it, that going online doesn't just have to mean what most of us here are doing now, which is going online in the privacy of your own home. Um, uh, we, I know we're all interpreting tech specifically in it, and it may not have been Joe's question quite, but we're all thinking of it in this particular way, but that's where we are a lot at the moment, uh, is thinking about tech in this way. Um, one other thing is the use of apps to build connections like Meetup and um, Organize, those things that allow us in local areas to use tech to find each other, to meet physically uh, and to build relationships. Um, but in terms of the creativity, the stuff that you've, the playable city stuff, I think that's fascinating, but I'm a Luddite in terms of all of that. I'm here to learn from, from those who know more on that stuff. Cause I think we don't do enough of that, uh, creativity in terms of how we act in public, you know, how we do our, what you might call a demo or a protest or, or whatever you want to call it, our public action. I think tech needs to, and the arts need to be much more part of that than they have been much as we keep doing the puppets and stuff too. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, Tony, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, it's just I was just trying to reflect then on kind of what comes first, the technology or the social need, I think is a question that I always end up asking myself. And so often, so much of technology and the technological advancements we make are just ways of maintaining and developing community. And this kind of the absolutely the kind of Zoom and Skype and things like that, these are all uh, platforms that have been around for ages but all of a sudden there was a, a deep social need for them in order for us to connect with each other and I was referring like thinking back to all the work that's happening on clusters and um, the work that we're doing in terms of at the moment we're looking at amplified publishing and that's all about how we communicate with each other expanded performance before that was about relationships between audiences and creators and and how those people communicate with each other um, so I think it always there, ha there has to be an underlying notion of kind of how how community helps us to how technology helps us to generate community and what that community means and how we harness then the power of, you have to have community before we can create change, I think. Um, and technology as a conduit to making that happen, I think is the most important way around for that equation, if you like. Thank you so much, Tony. I just want to say, I'm so sorry that I mixed up two of our fantastic projects. Um, so I called the project I was referring to about the capturing of the shadows, Hello Lamppost. 
Hello Lamppost is one project and shadowing is another project. So I was referring to shadowing and Joe has very kindly um, put links to both of these projects in the chat. So hopefully people can pick up on those links and do a little bit more digging, but we have you know, just some fantastic projects that have uh, fallen under the banner of Playable City and also some online labs that we've done. Um, the next thing to say is I'm aware that there are a couple of questions in the chat. I'm so sorry. I think it's because of my laptop. I'm really struggling to find them because when I'm scrolling, um, the chat is, is jumping out of order. So whoever has um, put the second question, who isn't Joe, if you could just copy and paste that into the Q&A channel, that will be very helpful for us. But I see that we have a question from Sarah Lucas that I want to present to our panelists. So Sarah says, I work on a number of community projects. I love these ideas of relational power. Do the panel have top tips on how to excite the community into action? Interest is always there, but actually getting communities to act and take up um, the opportunities is a constant battle. So does anyone have any thoughts on that? Tony? Hey. Yeah, thank you. That's a that's a lovely question, Matt. Right up my street. Um, in terms of it goes back to that kind of what what are you, when you bring a group of people together, what are you bringing to them, or what are you bringing them together around? Like what what are the parameters of what you're trying to do? It's, it's a very negative way to speak to start talking about the edges of things before you've talked about the possibility of things. But I think it's part of that development of an honest relationship to understand to develop common ground, to work out what it is that you're working towards um, and to enfranchise people from as early on as possible. So if you've had the idea to bring people in to help set those parameters with you, rather than going to people with the set of parameters to help people to understand the possibilities of, of, um, of what they can achieve and then to absolutely engage them in the building of the actions too. Um, so at um, Clusters, we developed a three, like a three part workshopy process um, called Understand, build, understand, explore, build. Um, and that looks at, first of all, so really grounding any kind of co-design process in people's experiences, understanding what's motivated people to be in the room, what's motivated them to take part in this conversation, what's gonna motivate people to create change and to really look at what, what common ground is in those spaces. And then also what is not common ground in those spaces. It's the space, it's the gaps that are the really interesting bit there. And how do you account for those? How do you bottom those out at the start of this thing I talked about? If there's a gray area. How do you make sure that you've talked it to death um, and that you've kind of understood it from every possible angle and that you really understand why it's gray and why it will continue to be gray. Um, and then after that is how we are moving on to then exploring kind of wider context and wider relationships and wider kind of power dynamics that you're working against or working with. Um, and then to move through to a process of trying to build the thing that you're trying to do. I think there has to be a lot of a lot of deep conversation and building before you try and engage people in action, I think. I'd be really interested if the panel think otherwise or if you've got other experiences. Khadija, I know you're involved in Black Lives Matter protests. Is that your experience of that? Um, yeah, I think it was really interesting um, sort of organising the protests. Um, it was different to the type of organizing they had done previously. Whereas I sort of follow your sort of <laughs> um, um, sort of organizational structure and kind of creating sort of like power and making sure people feel as though they have the resources and the space to sort of create movements that they they want to um, they want to see. Because my background is also in youth work. This was this was different. I think there was something in the air there, and this was off. I was working with young people, um, and I didn't reach out to them they reached they they reached out to me um so it was a group of young people from the university that i work at um some some of who i lecture who messaged me and said we want to organize a protest we don't know how and we're terrified <laughs> um and they, they 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 you know they were terrified of police because at that time you know we had um covert mandates asking people to stay home there was threats from from you know police at that time that was basically stating that if you did this sort of direct action you would be criminalized for it um and I remember the young the young person I worked with um, to organize the protest just decided to start a, a very much like a Twitter campaign. And all he asked was his for his, he was asking everyone to pull up. Um, and he just said, if you care about me, just pull up. Um, and that was the message and that message echoed in the digital sphere. And we had thousands of people show up. We didn't expect it, um, but they just did. Um, and now I've sort of 
taken a step back and I've seen this group of young people now actually completely shift, shift their organizing from something that was very much a sort of direct action, let's get out onto the streets to, okay, now we need a more formal, a more organized structure in how we operate. Now we have particular demands from the community. Now we want to engage in projects. Now we want to engage with other organizations and they've created, you can um, Google them, they're called All Black Lives um, UK. They've created their own sort of youth led <laughs> movement from this. Um, and it's been beautiful to see, beautiful to see that sort of organic eruption of power then transform into something that for a long time I thought we're just going to show up at a protest and that's going to be it. But no, it transformed into something sustainable. It transformed into something long term. Um, and these students, these young people had a had a radical imagination that I was terrified of, you know, the things that they wanted to do, the things they thought they could do. I was like, oh, guys, I don't know. Um, and I decided at that moment I, I was I was being a bit of a party for and to step back and to let them take ownership of the ideas that they wanted to see and the things that they wanted to see happen um, and just be supportive and just be a guiding force and just be that person that says, you know what, I know you've got this great idea and I know you might think you're the only one who has this, but there's this organization that actually does something similar. Why don't you try and connect with them and learn from them? Um, and that was that was amazing. And, and I think, yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's a kind of a bit of having that sort of organic sort of need to be out in the streets, direct action, coupled with an idea and imagination of what one wants to see. And then working with organizations, doing that work of coalition building, doing that work of thinking through what actual real tangible action means and working towards that, especially for these young people. Thank you so much, Khadija. Um, I wonder if Keith and or Francesca has anything to add? Okay, I, I was just gonna add, um, thinking back to, the, to the, the question, that also something that came to mind was just the different forms that action can take. So I know that sometimes the work that people are doing isn't very visible or, you know, we've all been speaking about the fact that we're seeing, you know, it's not just about the digital, um, it's, it's, it's also about, you know, different settings. And, and we're aware that some people have been doing things online for, for a long time in a way that hasn't been recognised. And um, other people might not be able to make use of that technology. So in response to that question, I was just thinking about sometimes it might seem as though action isn't occurring when it is. And, and just being um, attentive to the fact that action action takes so many different forms and especially sustained long-term action and you know that the planning the, the organizing and um, like, like Khadija was just saying right now you know moving from and um, that that particular moment to what next how can we keep this going and thinking about pace in relation to all of this um, and yeah also maybe being mindful of dig digital tech and, and, and people's awareness of surveillance and data acquisition which is why just because we can't perhaps see it or just because I, I personally don't know about it doesn't mean that it's not happening and that's always an exciting prospect to to, to know there's other stuff going on in terms of this vital action um, and we don't need to know about the details of that and actually if we did that that could put those involved in that work at risk. I just wanted to add to um, Francesca's point um, absolutely and I think so often as well the assumption that something isn't happening um, is due to its being strategically invisibilized, especially in, in the sort of digital and agri algorithmic space where we see particular types of action actually be, you know, part of that sort of squashing by the state and part of that, you know, surveillance. And I know lots of, for example, just back to, um, Black Lives Matter in the UK, um, a lot of people don't know what they did. Um, a lot of people didn't know that these were activists that have been doing work since 2013. A lot of people didn't know that these were activists that bail out people that are part of sort of abolitionist organizing, that are youth workers that were on the ground. So a lot of people were like, well, where did you come from? And it's like, we've been here for a long, long time. Um, a lot of them face violence from the state, a lot of them face violence from, you know, fascist and white supremacist organizations. So had to um, essentially digitally scrub themselves um, because of the safety um, element of what they were kind of having to deal with. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. And actually very often because you can't see it means it's actually being repressed by the state, means it's being surveilled, means it's being invisibilized in particular ways. And on a final point, there's so many people um, and I'm thinking about this in relation to how we think about citizenship, how we think about who gets to claim ownership, who gets to exist within the world in which we, we, we currently know. And there are so many people who, due to the logics of the border regime, are completely invisibilized, that exist within the peripheries, who can't have a presence, who can't have a name, who are doing action but can't put their names to it. And we should always sort of hold those people in regard um, because the work that they're doing is some of the most potent 
action for change. And we can't see them because the state doesn't recognize them, but the work is still happening. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Khadija. Um, I will signpost people to um, an event that we held as part of Container Magazine. So Container is an online magazine that is uh, supported by the Southwest Creative Technology Network and also Bristol and Bath Creative R&D. Um, and a couple of months ago, we ha had an e event where we hosted um, a number of precarious migrants, so asylum seekers, refugees, um, people with experience of the hostile environment. And we held them in a space using avatars, so in an online space where they were, they were anonymized and they had the, the, the freedom for just um, over an hour just to share about their stories. And that was an event that we produced over a number of months to ensure that, not, that we were not just extracting stories from them, um, but we were fulfilling our duty of care to, towards them. And myself as a precarious migrant, I, I hosted that um, space. And, and the reason I'm signposting it is, is for those who are interested to listen, um, kind of just to, to, not that what Khadija has said requires any validation, but just to, to, to validate it and say, there are individuals who are really doing the work behind the scenes. But as Khadija has said, borders, are stopping them from being able to you know, come out into the public and say, this is the work that we are doing, but they are doing fantastic work. They're fighting for precarious migrants to be able to um, receive the COVID vaccine. They're fighting for people to get status with the home office. They're literally fighting to stop people from taking their lives because of you know, border violence. So solidarity to our siblings in that fight. Um, there is another question that has been placed in the Q&A. This is from Teju Aliu. So just to say that uh, Teju has indicated that this question may be um, more relevant, I think, to a North American context, but I do think it's probably um, useful for us to try and, and see if we can answer it. So Teju asks, how does an individual reclaim their power within a large society or country in the midst of a highly divided and ideologically fragmented environment. So that is people's willingness perhaps to be vaccinated um, versus COVID mandates. And I'm sure that there's so many other, you know, kind of um, things that also apply to this in terms of ideological division. So I do feel that while this is relevant to the North American context, it's also relevant here to the UK as well. So um, to our panelists, does anyone have any thoughts? I'm not sure if this is going to sound too critical of the question, uh, but we'll see. Like Khadija talked at the very beginning about desocialization of power. Mm -hmm. And I think when we talk about reclaiming power, it's really important to think of it in a socialized way. That we're not about uh, individual, like power, the relational power therefore means it's a power of relationship. And, but I guess, I'm trying to answer the question, uh, um, so we don't talk enough, I think, just so we don't talk enough about power, we don't talk enough about self-interest. Mm -hmm. uh, and we worry sometimes that if we do, then we won't find common cause uh, because our self-interest somehow has to match. And of course it doesn't always, but just because it doesn't, doesn't mean we can't find common interest. Uh, we, uh, so in Citizens UK, we encourage people to, to have a public narrative, to talk about what matters to them, who they belong to, what they're angry about, what their aspirations are. And to the extent that they are willing to share that with one another in order to build public relationships. Uh, we did this uh, around the misogyny hate crime in Nottingham, the first place to make misogyny hate crime in the, in the UK. Um, and eventually brought together, I think it was a women's group, an LGBT group and a black Pentecostal church. Leaders from each of those in a room together uh, for a house meeting. And, um, and it shared a story of hate crime in the rounds without interruption. And the experience was different and the need and the agenda was different and the self-interest was different, but they found common cause uh, in, in seeing each other's humanity and being angry now for each other, uh, even if they didn't agree on a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> they agreed that each other should not be treated like this. And so they brought this room uh, on other issues too, but of a thousand people to the police and crime commissioner uh, around this issue. And now um, the, we are trialing this nationally and we want to make intersectional hate crime recognized as well um, off the back of that. But that only happens because 
uh, we re-socialize, if, that uh, if that's a word, I've just discovered de-socialize, so I'm really excited about that. We re-socialize power, and if we are happy to talk about our self-interest with people who are strangers to us, as we kind of build a new company together. Thank you so much, Keith. Tony, did you have something you wanted to add? I was just going to say, Keith, you've very well articulated, better than I did, what I was trying to explain earlier when I said that you have to start with understanding each other. And actually, that conversation that I was referring to when I was talking about gaps and commonality, the gaps are the self-interest um, within that. Actually, what is it that you're taking out of this equation? I'd argue as well, Khadija, that a thousand people meeting in the street was the, an example of exactly the same thing. Everybody's come with a common cause, but with different motivators that bring people to that conversation. And then the next bit is the explore. It's where you work out what legal parameters you're working within or what um, kind of what council parameters you're working within, Keith, and then you can build the thing, I think, afterwards. Thank you for illustrating my point much better than I did. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so I much, Tony. To, to yeah, I just wanted to say to so the question, it's so difficult for me, and I think I, I used to come from a place where I thought about the individuality of my power as something that was important, something that made me, that something that grounded myself. Um, and actually the last few years has taught me so much about myself and, you know, perhaps that that particular sort of idea of this need to be so individual and the need to reassert a sort of individualistic empowerment was was somewhat of um, very, very young hubris. Um, and now as I've gotten older, as I've gotten, as I've immersed myself in community, I feel like I know myself, I know my power so much more because my power is absolutely situated within the communities that I'm a part of. Um, my power it makes more clarity, makes more sense to me as it's interconnected with other people. Um, I'm thinking about how, um, and I had this, I, I, I did this session where I created this sort of framework where, you know, when we think about things like, for example, the language of self-care being de-radicalized, the self becoming the individual, but the self was never as articulated by Lord, the individual, the self was the self in the community, the oh. self in the context of what we provide to each other what we owe to each other mm -hmm. um and i started to think about self-care as a community care right looking after myself making sure i'm okay isn't for myself it's for the people who rely on the people who i'm accountable to the communities yeah. that i'm accountable to so when i think about how an individual reclaims their power for me my individual reclamation of my power could not exist my safety my survival could not exist without the plethora of black women like Faraha who held me in a space, made me see, feel seen and valued and made me feel like I owed something to them. And I always think about, you know, I owe it to my community to survive. I owe it to my community to ensure that I'm, I'm feeding myself, to ensure that I'm not burning myself out, to, not, to ensure that I'm not working myself to the bone. I owe that to the people who care for me and who care about me to be ready and to be prepared and to be willing to fight when they call me up to fight with them. Um, and that for me is, is that, that sort of power of self. Um, so I just wanted to leave you with that. Bless you, Khadija, my sister. Thank you for saying that. Um, so we literally have five minutes left. I'm wondering if anyone has any quick one or two liners that they would like to leave us off with. No pressure. <laughs> The, the only thing I was going to say is, for, I, I just feel like it, it, it's all been said. I don't think I've got anything to add to this. I just want to echo all of what, what everybody else has been saying. But I was thinking that within this conversation, there have been, um, yeah, really interesting reflections to do with, you know, like visibility. And, and I'm just thinking about in, in terms of that and power and um, the refusal to make something legible, the refusal to make something visible and, and to keep coming back to this point just because people aren't aware of it does not mean it's not going on. And, and for some people that can be part of a reclamation of power, but also um, beyond that at a very basic level that can be essential to survival. So I think because of the emphasis on digital, especially throughout these last 18 months, there's sometimes this um, misguided belief that just because just because it wasn't tweeted and um, <laughs> it, it didn't happen. And mm -hmm. although that's a really flippant thing to say, I think it is concerning when, when we see people actually apply that um, to, to real life and um, what's erased and what's obstructed. And also, you know, as, as has, has been spoken about here, what it means when people are calling for, for people to so-called reveal themselves or, or to provide details that absolutely cannot be provided um, because of the issues to do with oppression and to do with state violence and um, that mm -hmm. have been spoken about today. Thank you so much, Francesca. 
panelists, any anything that you want to say quickly? Keith? Because I love quotes, I'll pick a quote. Uh, Alice Walker, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Thank you for that. I was trying to avoid being cheesy, but I don't know <laughs> if I'm going to manage it, to be perfectly honest. Um, I think so, just to go off the back of what Keith's... Uh, Keith's quote was there. I think the, the language of reclaim there is really interesting. And um, this is where it's going to get cheesy because to reclaim suggests that you relinquished it at some point and you don't have it. You do have it. It's just been silenced. There you go. Cheesy as hell. My apologies. Thank you. We <laughs> love it. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have a one liner other than just thank you for Raha. Um, thank you for putting this together. Um, thank you for holding us in this space. And you promised us safety in the beginning and I felt safe throughout. So I really appreciate that. Um, thank you. And yeah, just all the work that you do, um, so much of it that a lot of people don't recognize, don't see the work that you do in the sort of margins. We really appreciate you and I really appreciate you. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Khadija. Thank you very much. Um, and I just want to thank you, um, dear panelists, Francesca, Khadija, Keith, Tony. Um, thank you for your participation today. Thank you also for all the work that you do behind the scenes. I know that I, in my personal life, um, in my fight with the home office, in in my, you know, trying to take action towards social justice. You've all played a part in building me up. So I'm very grateful for that. And I'm very grateful that we could have this conversation um, today. And just to our audience members, thank you so much for joining us. Remember that you will be able to watch this on Watershed's YouTube, as well as the other seminars that we have had before this. We do have one more seminar on the 18th of November that is going to be hosted by Watershed's Zoe Raspash, who is our Environmental Emergencies Action Researcher. So Zoe has um, brought together a panel that are going to be discussing how to put collaboration at the heart of climate work. Um, so we hope to see you back on that seminar and otherwise, I guess, you know, we can bring this to an end, sending you all off with love, hoping that you, I was going to say arrive at your destination safely, but um, I think, you know, we're all <laughs> at our places of work or at home. So um, thank you very much, everyone, and wishing you a fantastic evening. I'm just going to hold on to the panelists for a quick debrief and yes, sending you all off in love.